Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marianne Norick. I'm Anchor's Chief Corporate Engagement Officer. Thank you so much for joining us today for Metascad's sponsored partner webinar called The Leader's Role in Implementing Significant Change, Achieving a Cultural Shift with Tom Pomerantz. I'm delighted for the opportunity to provide the introduction for the session. As Metascad has been an anchored national partner at the gold level since the program was founded, we enjoy and sincerely benefit from our engagement with Metascan and its team members. Today's session is going to provide all of you with an array of strategies and tools to effectively facilitate and implement culture shifts and innovations. Tom is going to reveal why people commonly resist change with strategies that could be used to support other employees and stakeholders in overcoming their resistance. Today's presenter is Dr. Thomas Pomeranz, a nationally recognized authority, trainer, clinician, and consultant in the field of services with people with disabilities. He's had an affiliation with Anchor for 30 years. Over the last 50 years, Tom has conducted thousands of webinars and programs like these throughout Canada and the United States. He received his Bachelor and Master of Science degrees in special education and a doctorate in mental health administration from Indiana University, followed by postgraduate work from the University of Notre Dame in the area of experimental psychology. Tom has held a variety of top-level administrative posts in community-based service organizations and three large state-operated facilities. He is currently the president and CEO of Universal Lifestyles, and Tom is also a longtime advisor for Metascad. He was part of the inaugural Metascat Advisory Council and has been integral to the solution, the evolution of their solutions for many years. Tom, I'm delighted to turn this over to you and really look forward to this session. Thank you for being with us. Well, thank you, Mary. And I must say, if my mother was still living and she's not, I would have been convinced she wrote that about her son. Thank you for <laughs> that. That was quite an introduction. Thank you very much. And I I also want to first thank um, Anchor and Metasked for extending to me this opportunity to spend a few minutes with um, all of you talking about the leader's role in implementing significant change, a cultural shift. I had the opportunity to take a look at the attendance roster, and I was delighted to see so many organizations that I'm currently working with and have worked with over the years. So I know I have a lot of colleagues out there. Before we even look at the goals, I'm going to share with you the goals we will be achieving during this session. I was thinking about the changes that have occurred. This is, in fact, I think my 54th year in the field. And if someone said, you know, what do you think about these last 54 years? Well, the changes that have occurred have been really dramatic, really significant. And you know, those changes, and many of you who may have only have been in the field 10 years, 15 years or, or less, may not be aware of how dramatically our, our field has shifted over the last half century. I mean, during my tenure in the field, concepts of the right to risk came into being. And we thought this was like really significant. Concept of continuum of service, the idea of least restrictive alternative and least restrictive environment, you know, the dramatic change of moving from a medical model to a developmental model, to a habilitation model, to a participatory inclusionary model, that was significant. The introduction of the concept of an importance of age appropriateness, uh, the use of people first language and universal language, the introduction of self-determination, the closure of sheltered employment programs, you know, every time one of these things occurred, we thought, boy, this is a significant change. You know, I've given consideration to retirement. And the one thing that's standing in my way is what is currently happening in the field. All of those changes that I've just shared with you truly pale in relationship to what we are experiencing now and what is about to happen in the months in just the next couple of years ahead. And that is why this topic is so key because of the changes that we are facing. And it's gonna take all of us, you know, all of you as leaders within your organization to help assure that these changes can be embraced by our staff, families, the men and women who we support. So let's take a quick look at some of the session's goals that 
uh, I hope to achieve today, we will discuss the four powerful strategies to facilitate a cultural shift. Every organization has a culture and some cultures will be better adapted to dealing with these changes than others will address that. You'll be able to explain of five of the 10 commandments of change. You'll be able to compare and contrast. This is going to be really important. Positional authority versus personal power. You will be able to demonstrate an improvement in your personal power, which is key for all leaders. You will be able to detail the hierarchy of likability. You will be able to discuss the five essential leadership practices and describe how to support people in being comfortable with change. You know, for most of us, most people, change is difficult. You know, we tend to resist it for a variety of reasons. We'll look at those reasons and see what we can do to support those around us in being more accepting of change, including ourselves. And you'll be able to identify why people resist change. Um, there was a, a gentleman named Machiavelli, goes back, I think, something to like the 1200s. And among the many things that he wrote. He wrote a book called The Prince. And I stumbled onto this page in The Prince and I thought, holy mackerel, as old as this statement is, it is so applicable today. And I wanted to kick off this session by sharing this, um, I'm not sure what you call it, but this narrative uh, from The Prince. And listen very carefully, okay? It's entitled, It Must Be Considered. It must be considered that there is nothing more difficult to carry out, nor more doubtful of success, nor more dangerous to handle than to initiate a new order of things. And by the way, that's exactly what we're about. For the reformer, that's you and me, has enemies in all those who profit by the old order, and only lukewarm defenders in all those who would profit by the new order. This lukewarmness arising partly from the fear of their adversaries who have the laws in their favor and partly from the incredulity of mankind who do not truly believe in anything new until they've had actual experience of it. Thus it arises that on every opportunity for attacking the reformer, that's you and I, his, her opponents do so with the zeal of partisans, the others only defend him or her half-heartedly, so that between them, he, she runs great danger. Well, in my opinion, that is as true today as the day it was written in the 1200s. No doubt about it. And we need to keep that in mind as we move forward. So the question, the question isn't, isn't who is going to let me make these changes, it's who's going to stop me. That's the mentality of a leader, in my opinion. An Ron, right? You folks are familiar with her. So for many of, the, of us in, addressing the changes we are about to undertake, that I'm gonna be discussing those and obviously the leadership strategies to facilitate that, it is a leap of faith. You know, it's almost like you gotta take a deep breath and say, holy mackerel, look at what we're about to do. Um, many of the things that we are now about to do, we have wanted to happen many myself certainly and many of my colleagues have wanted the changes that we are about to undertake to have occurred for many many years and now you know we're we're at that point where we're we're beginning to implement these changes and it sort of feels like the dog has finally caught up with the car now one of the many changes and certainly perhaps one of the most significant is the final rule i've been training all over the country on the final rule. I'm sure many of you have been in some of my sessions on the final rule. The final rule in and of itself, there's probably nothing more significant than the final rule in terms of how it's going to impact our services. And I'll be talking a little bit about that and these changes, okay? I wanna use the word seismic to describe what is happening. And those of you in California will probably really uh, appreciate that word excuse the landline in the background. You know, there are people that still have landlines, guys, okay? Uh, our industry is being rocked by change, no doubt about it. Uh, you know, wasn't that many years ago that with rare exception, every agency was using pen and paper. And now we have transitioned for the most part to electronic record keeping systems. I mean, in the acute, cal acute healthcare area, like hospitals, they're probably at 95%. 
uh, electronic records. Uh, obviously, many hospitals are 100%. Uh, Long-term care, uh, my guess is probably somewhere around 60%. We are in what many of us refer to as allied health. We're still at probably only 35 or 40% uh, electronic healthcare records, some people call them uh, e EHRs, some people call them EMRs, electronic medical records. We still have a long way to go, but when that change is introduced to any agency, it takes leadership to facilitate it because it's a significant change in an organization. The elimination of state-operated residences, no institutions. You know, it wasn't that many years ago um, in Indiana, and I'm talking to you from Indianapolis, I'm an Indiana resident, we had six large state operated developmental centers in, in the state. And if someone would have said, we're closing all the institutions, my response is, well, you're out of your mind. Where are all these people gonna go? Well, we haven't had a state operated developmental center in this state for probably 15, 18 years, at least, maybe even a little bit longer. Um, and it was hard for many of us at that time to have a vision of what it would be like without these state operated residences. If you want to, and I may refer to this again, a really good book to look at that shows you the changes that are occurring. And by the way, I used to be able to lie and exaggerate all the time in my training. I can't really do that anymore. People Google everything that comes out of my mouth. But for a lot of the things I'm sharing with you, take a look at state of the state reports. It was originally started by David Braddock out of the University of Illinois, and then and David is now retired, but um, he then moved on to the University of Colorado. And the state of state of reports will will document, show the trends of what is happening and how significant these changes are and how they are facilitating. I believe we now have uh, 13 states, maybe 14, that have closed all their state operated developmental centers. And I believe all but one or two states have closed at least one. And you can anticipate they will all be closed. That is my opinion. There's no doubt in my mind. Well, that has a tremendous implication in terms of change for the provider community. I'm working actively in Iowa. Glenwood Resource Center is closing, which has a significant impact upon the provider community. Um, next, next issue, elimination of congregate residences. And some of you were saying, what? No group homes? That's right. And I'm, I'm thinking of all the agencies I currently work with that provide the residential services with, with, uh, in non-congregate settings. Modern support services in um, Southern California, you know, is a good uh, good example of that. Um, diversified assessments in West Virginia doesn't have any congregate residences. And I know for a fact, many of you as provider agencies do not have any congregate residences. Go to state of the state reports, look what's happening in terms of the number of people who are residing you know, the, the numbers of people are residing in a given residence, they're going down, 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 down. And with the final rule, there is no doubt in my mind that we will see the elimination of congregate residences. And I know some of you are thinking, but how could that be? That's impossible. Guess what? That's the exact same thing we were thinking when we said we were gonna close all the state institution. It's impossible. No, it's not impossible. Next, no facility-based day services. Now, you're saying, what? You gotta be kidding me. Take a look at the final rule. It's, it's specific. We can't segregate people with developmental disabilities in facility-based day services. They have to have an integrated day. And you know, some people are thinking, well, how in the world are we gonna make that happen? Well, you know, it was uh, 1964. We had this president, John F. Kennedy. He got on television, predates a lot of you, I know got on television, he said, by the end of the decade, the United States will put a man on the moon. And many of us were thinking, the moon, it's a quarter of a million miles away. There's no air on the moon, there's no water, gravity, one sixth of the of Earth in terms of gravity. What was the status of computers in 1964? Not far from the abacus, right? By 1969, we put a man on the moon because the people at NASA weren't saying, how are we gonna get to the moon? They said, we are going, going to the moon, and they made it happen. No one is asking us to put somebody on the moon. What they're asking us is to provide people an integrated day. No facility-based day services. Uh, and by the way, it's not just the final rule. I'm gonna put this up here too. I'm gonna go through it quickly. It's deserving of a long conversation. But the Olmstead Act is why, why are all the state developmental centers in the country 
in the process of downsizing and or closing. They're, they're downsizing in order to close. California had six, those of you who are with me from California, six operated state uh, developmental centers now have none. Does somebody think that the state legislatures are so compassionate and caring that they really want to improve quality of life and they're closing the state institutions? No, it's not it. It's the Olmstead Act. They know ultimately the Department of Justice is going to come after them. And if I were to ask you, well, what do you think ADA is? Because this Olmstead Act is a Supreme Court interpretation or a decision based upon the Americans with Disabilities Act. A lot of people would say, well, ADA is about cutting curbs, widening door frames and expanding bathroom stalls. No, that's a very small part of it. ADA at the heart of ADA is to really provide people access, right? Access, not just from one side of the door to the other, but access to their community. And when we operate, when people live in institutional settings, by definition, they are being segregated, which is in violation of the Olmstead Act. Now, there are no Olmstead police going around said, who's violating this? It requires someone to file a complaint. Then there's an investigation that is conducted by the feds and so forth. This is one of the reasons states are so actively working to try to transfer people out of nursing homes who have developmental disabilities into community-based settings. The Department of Justice regulations implementing Title II of the ADA require public entities to administer their services and programs and activities in the most integrated setting and appropriate for the needs of qualified individuals with disabilities. And I think, <coughs> excuse me, by the way, and I think most of us recognize how far we are from that. What you will see in the next 12 to 18 months, a tremendous ex expediting of that goal. I mean, just a tremendous expediting of that goal, especially with the, the facilitation on, and closure of state operated developmental centers and the closure of facility based day supports. <coughs> Are we not seeing it with the closure of sheltered employment programs, right? Closing in many of your agencies, I know for a fact. Uh, operated children employment programs and you're not you're, you're not operating them anymore the decision affects not only persons in institutions and segregated settings i don't know why we're so hesitant about using the word segregated when applied to the people we support you know you call it what it is if it looks like a rose and smells like a rose and feels like a rose it's a rose it's segregation but also people with disabilities who are at risk of institutionalization including people with disabilities on waiting lists so if you are on a waiting list to, to have an opportunity to be in a more integrated setting, then you, that, that waiting list is in violation of Olmstead as well. So an individual living with their parents, elderly parents who have been on a waiting list to live in a supported uh, residential kind of environment, they've been on that waiting list for 20 years, that would be likely deemed in violation of the Olmstead Act. Translation. People with disabilities must receive services and supports in the least restrictive community setting. So electronic records, elimination of state operated residents, elimination of congregate residents, no facility-based day services. What about this? Mergers. I mean, what was announced? What, five weeks ago, six weeks ago? I, I didn't, I, I don't know if any of you are actually in attendance, but two of probably of the largest not-for-profit providers in the country just announced their merger, Meriki and Elwin out of Pennsylvania. Elwin was established, I believe, in 1859. Whoever would have thought these two behemoths of organization, multi-state operations, and sometimes people think, well, you know, we're not for profit, we're not gonna merge, we're not gonna acquire. I mean, look at the faith-based organization. And uh, some of you are, are faith-based. We had um, Bethagy and Martin Luther Homes, and now you are sitting there as Mosaic, right? And you talk about major changes in employees' life, mergers and acquisitions. I can't make it through a week where I'm not involved with an agency that is either acquiring or being acquired. I'm here with you today because I was Vice President of Operations and Chief Clinical Officer of the second largest for-profit provider in the country, and we were acquired by the largest provider in 1999. So that is huge, and that is being expedited, by the way. The, the, the rate at which mergers and acquisitions are occurring, they're occurring with much more rapidity. 
small providers are just going to have an extremely hard time. It's one of the probably one of the larger changes that uh, is occurring within our field. And I, I want to make my point here. If we don't think that's true, let's look at the rest of the world. Let's look at outside our field. When I was little, my parents bought their groceries at a family-owned grocery store. We don't even have any family-owned grocery stores, to my knowledge, where I live. I mean, they're all Kroger and just these huge Eagle, huge multi-state, multi-chain grocery stores. When um, I was younger, my parents knew the pharmacist, Mr. Lamont, who had the cor corner drugstore. We don't have any corner drugstores. I mean, we have, you know, Walgreens, CVS, and they're having a hard time because they're trying to fight the Costco drugstores. So the small drugstore is basically gone. My, my daughters, I have three daughters, were born in freestanding hospitals. We don't have any freestanding hospitals here. They're all part of huge change. You know, Indiana University healthcare system, as an example, because the freestanding hospitals just can't make it. The bastion of family-owned businesses was the family-owned mortuary. And they have all but disappeared. Many of them have kept their names, so people think that they're still family-owned, but for the most part, they're not. They just can sustain themselves. Solo medical practices. I would say probably the only solo medical practices we have are these boutique medical practices where people sign up and you, they pay so much a month and the physician will come to your house. We may have a few cosmetic plastic surgeons here and there that are in solo practice. But other than that, they're all part of large medical groups, medical systems, part of the hospital systems. They're practically gone. Family-owned neighborhood theaters, they, they, they can't really exist. You know, there was a day they used to have those big tubs of film, right? They'd ship them from one theater to another. Well, there is no movie film anymore. It's all downloaded by satellite electronically. And those systems cost a quarter of a million dollars. The only way you can make it work is by having a 14, what do they call that? 14 uh, screenplex, you know, cinema. It's the only way you can make it work. So small movie theaters are just a thing of the past unless they're using film that was made a number of years ago. Well, I think we can all agree to this. I mean, those are facts. And so it's hard for anyone to make a case that the same would not be true in our industry. You talk about changes, this one I really wanna share with you. I mean, this is like really significant. The vast majority of all of you I'm speaking to, not all of you, but the vast majority are struggling and challenged with hiring staff. I mean, everywhere we look, you know, there are issues with hiring staff. And the forecast for us is grim. I wanna spend a moment and explain what is happening, okay? In the 1960s, about 40% of all entering freshmen uh, were women, okay, in colleges, universities. As of 2022, 2023, nearly 60% of all entering freshmen are women. We tend not to hire women with four-year ba four bachelor's degrees as DSPs. We've taken them out of the system. You know, the number of people that are getting older in relationship to our entire population is increasing dramatically every year. So the need for home health care, home chore services, assisted living, long-term care, the need for staff in those areas is huge. You know, they're pulling out of the same labor pool that we're pulling out. of. I don't know if you thought about this, but it was not that many years ago that you would seldom hear of a woman who is an electrician, a woman who was a plumber, a woman who was a welder, a woman who was a cross-country a semi-truck driver. Now, those numbers, go ahead, Google it. Those numbers are increasing dramatically, those opportunities for women. And those women who might otherwise have been DSPs are being pulled in that direction. And, and as I go through this list, men are not taking the place of those women. In other words, they're not coming to the forefront and saying, we want to be DSPs. There may be some increase in men, but it's not certainly in any way proportional to the number of women we are losing in these various areas. And another huge concern is the limitations that have been set on immigration. I mean, for many of your agencies, those of you I'm talking to from California, New York, Detroit, Miami, I mean, a huge percentage of your staff are foreign born. And now with those restrictions, it's becoming further difficult. So we're having major challenges with regard to staffing. That's why leadership becomes so 
so critical, if you will. And I mean, we just see the signs everywhere. And Medicaid waiver, the elimination of ICFs. You know, I work for the second largest ICF provider in the country. Go to state of the state reports and look what's happening to ICFs. I mean, they're just every single year they're going down and you can basically project where there'll be no more ICFs. Um, they are just, they were wonderful in their day. They just are not where we are now. They're very institute, they're institutional rules and regulations, obviously. And um, they tend to be larger congregate residences. They are highly regulated. And those type of issues tend to be in conflict with what we now view as best practice. And I think many of you are aware of that. By the way, don't throw rocks at me. I'm the messenger, okay? I'm not the one that is making these changes. I'm sharing them with you. So we, we have a, a sensitivity to what we as leaders are faced with. And all of us have to be prepared to deal with these things. And I, I will tell you, probably the most significant changes are those that are not on the list. And there are some things I have not put on the list because they may be even too sensitive. I mean, I'll verbalize it, but that is unionization. I mean, a number of your agencies are now being faced with staff that are being canvassed and activity moving toward unionization. And that's a huge, a huge one. Uh, excuse me there for my sip. Okay, so let's take a look at our leadership strategies. Okay, here we go. I'm going to put some tools in our toolbox. We're going to make, we have little time, so we really have to hit this hard. There's basically two strategies we can take in terms of implementing change in our organization. Since it is a cultural shift that has to occur in order to deal with these changes, they're not going to be made by writing new policy and procedure. Now, there may need to be some policy and procedure that needs to be developed, but it's not about policy and procedure. We're not going to make these things happen by writing a purchase order, right? It is a change of heart and mind. That's the point. Now, when we try to change heart and mind of our staff, which is the foundation of an organizational culture, we're not going to make that happen with positional power. There's a big difference between um, proposition and imposition. Management tends to impose, you know, we give directives, we write a job description, say this is what you have to do and so forth. And positional power has value, don't get me wrong. Everybody has positional power. Everyone from our frontline staff, obviously all the way up to the CEO of the organization. And positional power is derived from our job description and or the authority that is delegated to us by a superordinate, could be an immediate supervisor or somebody higher up in the organization. So you can have two people in an organization with the exact same job description and have two different levels of positional authority because in one case, their supervisor delegated additional duties to them, which they assumed a responsibility for. And thus their positional power is different than the person who maybe did not have those same duties delegated to them. So positional authority has value in, and I'm putting these up here quick so I don't have to go through them one at a time, promoting and disciplining people, promulgating policy, you know, writing policy, passing it and implementing it. And, but, right, it has little value in creating a culture of self-determination, dignity and respect, equality, responsibility, and making the type of cultural changes in an organization that are essential in meeting the new expectations with which we are faced. No doubt about it. So here's the bottom line, personal power. This is the key, this is where I'd like to focus our conversation. Uh, I tell people I don't even have to be smart because I'm really around a lot of very smart people. And I have an opportunity to be in the, I don't know, for lack of a better word, the guts of an organization. Because some organizations I've been working with, you know, for 15 years, 20 years, 25 years. Um, and I, I tend to see what works in an organization to shift the culture, to help staff accept change, and what does not work. And I will tell you, in those organizations that are doing extremely well and have their staff embrace change and making changes, 
it's the personal power that you see in leadership. There's no doubt about it. It's the personal power. Now, personal power is the power that is derived. It is given to one by others because they see that person, <coughs> excuse me, that leader as capable, competent, and caring. Excuse me, I have a cold. <coughs> Again, personal power is earned. It is given to one by others because they are perceived as capable, competent, and caring. Now, those are metaphorical words. We could say it's given to one because they're seen as knowledgeable, experienced, intelligent, empathetic, but you got my drift. In other words, it is something that is earned. It is an essential power of leadership. I really don't know how one can be a leader without personal power and only having positional authority. When one has personal power, you're able to bond with people, bond. Now I was trained as a radical behaviorist. Some of you know that. And the term bond for behaviorist is never in our vocabulary. You don't see the word bond in a typical ABA or operant kind of behavioral program. The reason you don't see the word bond is because Historically, it's not empiricized. It doesn't have an operational definition. So it was not part of my vocabulary, but now I recognize the importance of bonding in leadership. And this is what I believe. I, I can't prove it, but I believe it. I believe that when you bond with people, they're less likely to behave in a way to disappoint you. I can't prove it, but I believe it. So if we expect our staff to change, to be accepting of the new expectations that we are going to be holding for them. How are we gonna get them to do that? It's not enough just to train and educate, honestly. We can give people information, but if they're not willing to embrace it and make changes, you know, everything's gonna be the status quo. So the personal power is what is essential. You know, I'll hear a supervisor say, like a home manager, you know, Tom, I'll go in and tell my staff what to do. I'll show them what to do. We even sometimes give them these little mini tests and they'll know on a particular task or activity, they know exactly what to do. And then I leave, I come back two days later and they're doing the same thing. You know, as soon as I walked out, they went back to doing the way, doing what they did before. Well, what's interesting is that supervisor thinks that they're making a comment about their staff. Well. That statement, that description that they just said is when I walk out, they go back to doing what they were doing before. That's not a comment about the staff, that's a comment about the supervisor. Because when you bond with people, they don't wanna do something that is going to disappoint the person who supervises them. In my opinion, bonding is perhaps one of the most effective strategies for effective parenting. You know, all parents have positional authority, correct? It's given to them by the state, virtue of law. Parents through their positional authority can decide where their children are gonna be schooled, what religion they follow, what healthcare they receive, where they're gonna live, all that. But a parent, and I, I do a lot of parent effectiveness training, so that's why I'm using this as an example. But a parent who tries to raise their child with only parental authority, and I'm going to give you my opinion, is more likely to lose that child, lose control of that child by the time they're 12, because all they can do is consequate. The parent says, if I see you do that again, you're going to get it. Well, the kid's thinking is, yeah, I'm going to do it again, but you're not going to see it because he doesn't care. The parent who has effectively bonded, however, that child would not want to do anything to risk causing their parent a sense of disappointment. Bond, bond, bond. Another term we can use is emotional connectivity. That's a really good term as well. Also was not in my vocabulary. Now, when I discuss these issues with managers who wish to be leaders, some people will tend to invalidate the concept because you realize if it's invalidated, then you've freed yourself from any obligation to do it. 
And so what I will sometimes, when somebody has the, the courage to speak up in one of my trainings, I say, well, I'm not here to be friends with my staff. Okay, well, what are you hired to be? Their enemy? I mean, what's the point? The point is the way I bond with my wife is different than the way I bond with my daughters. The way I bond with my daughters is different than the way I bond with my grandchildren. The way I bond with my grandchildren is different than the way I bond with my best friend. Point being, bonding is always influenced by the role and function that we hold. Bond, bond, bond. What's interesting <clears throat> is there are very specific, we're gonna try to look at as many of these as we can, behavioral strategies that we can use in order to increase our effectiveness in bonding with our staff, which is the leadership essential in my opinion, right? <clears throat> Very specific ways of behaving. And here's the good news. There are two columns in life, right? There's a column in life of things we can't control and a column in life of things we cannot control. We need to focus on the controllable column. The controllable column is how we behave. I don't know about you, but I'm a full-time job for myself. It takes everything I got to manage my behavior and half the time I'm not successful. Just ask my wife, she'll tell you. So I'm looking at what it is I need to do in my interactions with staff in order to enhance my personal power so I can bond with them to facilitate them in accepting change. That is what leadership in part is about, right? Another component, and we're gonna drill down on some of those behaviors. Another component, if you will, of, of personal power is having emotional intelligence. And I'm sure many of you or some of you have read the book or books on emotional intelligence. And here's an interesting little definition. The capacity to be aware of, control, and express one's emotions and to handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and empathetically. I just love that definition, and there are probably many, but that's really a, a good definition. People are attracted to other people who handle interpersonal relationships judiciously and who are empathetic. How do you feel about people like that? We are drawn to them. We tend to be repulsed by people who behave just the opposite of that. Emotional leadership necessitates emotional intelligence, which is used to influence followers in a common goal. The ability, capacity, or skill to perceive, assess, and manage the emotion of oneself, right? The focus is us. You're, you're, we're not going to change anybody else's behavior until we change our own. So it all starts with us. And to me, that's the best news because that is one thing that is under our control of others and of groups. The essential trait of an effective coach is emotional intelligence. And you, you may want to look at that further. I mean, certainly people do two-day workshops just on emotional intelligence, so there's a lot to learn. Part of the process, and I try to, to do this in my training, I, I do it when I do, I think many of you know, I spend two to three days a week actually coaching on site. I'm not your typical talking head who just you know does keynotes and and webinars and so forth, but I'm actually on site two to three days a week coaching staff in the environments where they're, they're exercising the skills with the supervisor on my hip. And whether I'm coaching on site or whether I'm doing a webinar like this, what's I feel is really important in, in connecting with people to getting them motivated is to rock their vote, right? You gotta rock their vote. But how do you rock it without sinking it? See, that's that's really the challenge. It it can be. There has to be some deep sense of enthusiasm, excitement, uh, spirituality, if you will, that we have to exude in our relationships with others. And sometimes people come come back and will tell me, "Well, that's not who I am." Well, my response is, "Well, then fake it," you know. <laughs> Uh, there's an old adage, we all have a right to be crazy. We just don't have a right to behave that way. Behave healthy, even though we may not be. So we need to behave, in my opinion, with a sense of enthusiasm, positivity, excitement. I mean, you've seen some of these people who are in management positions and they create what I call a Paul. You familiar with that word? P-A-L-L? -L? Uh, 
even though you think you may not be, you are familiar. Paul bear, Paul bear means to carry, right? Paul is gloom, doom, sorrow, and sadness. You have some of these supervisors walking around looking like they got the worst case of hemorrhoids of any human being. I mean, how in the world can we expect staff to bond with them, to emotionally connect? I'm not saying it's impossible, but certainly having a sense of a positive spirit and excitement during, during times of significant change, the staff will be drawn to, will be feeling supported by it. Thus, inspire before you expire, right? If I could show you, um, if we made it through, you know, a huge number of PowerPoint slides, and I think this actual session, I commonly do this like over a day and a half or two days, and I'm giving you a strong glimpse of what this really looks like. And so I made a decision about what slides I could cover in like the 55 minutes I'm, I'm doing this. And in, in the whole day and a half or two days, I would put this slide in the top five, no doubt about it. This is it. So if you want to be an effective leader in facilitating change and an organizational shift in your, your agency, it's R before INT, relationships before issues and tasks. The relationship must always come first. And I'll be the first to tell you, I didn't get this. I wasn't taught this way. I mean, I'll never forget. I mean, my agency was acquired in 1999. I had started there in 1986. Got it. And everyone knew that when we were acquired, those acquired, those of us who were officers were not going to be retained. And, but don't feel sorry for us. I wouldn't be here doing this with you today if, because I'd still be there. I'm a great, great company. Uh, so a woman comes up to me, um, and this is in 1999, and the date is important, who was a, back then we used the R word, QMRP, what is it now, QIDDP, right? Because she was a nurse who was a home manager over two ICF homes in Canton, Ohio. And she comes up to me at one of my 10 minute breaks and says, Tom, there's something I've been wanting to tell you for a long time. And in a really serious way, I said, well, Judy, we only got two minutes of our break. I said, we're going to have lunch on site. Why don't you sit with me at lunch and you can tell me what you want to tell me. So again, the year was 1999. I started with the company in 86. She started with the company in 1984. And she says, Tom, do you remember when you came to the home, the two homes in Canton, Ohio, in the fall of 1988? And honestly, I I don't know where I was last week unless I look at the calendar. I said, well, Judy, you know, that's like 12 years ago or something. I don't remember coming to the home in the fall of 1988. She said, well, there's something I've been wanting to tell you for a long time. The night before you came to the home, she says, I sent the home coordinator. She was home manager. We had coordinators in each, every home that reports to home manager. Home, co home coordinator to the hardware store to buy two cans of green spray paint. I said, well, why did you have them buy two cans of green spray paint? She said, well, we had two evergreens in the front yard that had died. We know if you saw them, you'd be very upset. So we spray painted them green. I was mortified. I mean, do you, you know, but there was a time I would not even understood what she was saying. I got it now. You know, I understood it at that point. What she, what she in essence was saying, Tom, it didn't make any difference how experienced you may or may not have been. It didn't make any difference how knowledgeable you may or may not have been. It didn't make any difference how competent in the field you may or may not have been. You had nothing to share with us. We were spending all of our psychic energy trying to cover. I didn't have a relationship. And it brought to mind so many horrible thoughts. The one, you know, those of you who operate ICFs and even some license, licensing requires it. I, you know, I used to go into a home, walk into the kitchen, home manager standing there, a DSP next to him, open a cabinet, see a dish that's chipped. Because you know, in ICF, your dishes have to be impervious, right? I would take the dish out of the cabinet and dramatically fling it in the wastebasket with no sensitivity to how that was impacting that home manager and that staff. I don't think I was mean spirited. I don't think I was malevolent. I just didn't think I had a lot of water in my well then. And you know, sometimes hurting people hurt people and it's not mean spirited. It's just, we can't do that, you know? And I know that's a horribly dramatic example, but 
it's the relationship has to, has to come first. You need to, we always need to figure that out. And here's a wonderful quote. And some of you will know it just by virtue of the fact that you see the title, right? Say, do feel. People will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. People will never forget how you made them feel. Maya Angelou, man, she nailed it, in my opinion. That's it. How do we make people feel? That's the personal power, right? And sometimes it's most difficult to form that relationship, to form the bond with those staff who were members of the underground. You know those staff, you know, the roll into the eyes, yawning when you talk to them, walk away from you while you're still in the middle of the sentence, engaged in gossip. They have no water in their well, guys. Those are the most difficult staff to emotionally connect with. But in order to do that, <coughs> excuse me again, sorry. In order to connect with them, you got to be near them. You got to be with them. It's no different <coughs> than you have three kids, right? Two of them are absolute darlings. Then you have that third one from your first marriage, right? Like his father. That's the one who you have to spend the most time with. So in trying to make these emotional connections to make sure that we have personal power with all staff, not just the ones that it's easiest to get along with, we need to spend time with those staff who are the most difficult. Remember what Caesar said, stay close to your enemies, right? I wanna talk about likability. Um, there was a book a number of years ago, people have books all the time to read, read a book. And uh, it, was, it was called The Likability Factor. And I'm blocking on the name of the author right now, but uh, Sanders, Sanders is his last name. And I thought, man, I'm reading this book. I said, this is like a really great, great book. A lot of this, I can take this, stuff. but I just can't take stuff out of a book and use it. Sometimes, even if I give reference, it's not like I'm writing a term paper in college where you can use anything as long as you, you know, acknowledge where it came from. When you do what I do, you really need more permission. And so I thought, uh, I looked this guy up on, I couldn't find an email address or anything. And so finally looked him up on the email address and his books were on the New York Times bestseller list for like three years at a time. He was getting like $75,000 a lecture. And um, I thought, well, I'm going to send him an email and say, you know, can I use some of your material? And and dear Mr. Sanders, you know, I just got a copy of your book, Likeability Factor. And there's, you know, I told him what I did. There's some information on page 2, 15, 28, 35. Would you give me permission to use this information? You know, hit send, right? I thought, I'm never going to hear from this guy. And I'm not kidding. It wasn't within two hours I get a response. Dear Dr. Pomerantz, I received your request. And I want you to know, certainly, you can use any of the material in my book. You know, he said, all I ask is that you go online to Amazon and you put in some comments about how you appreciated my book. He said, additionally, please note, there's an attachment on this email. I'm sharing with you some additional content that will be in the next book that is not yet published. And I'm thinking, holy mackerel, this guy's unbelievable. Then I realized, he wrote the book on likability. Do I like this guy? This guy is great. See, he's figured it out, right? So our likability behavior differs, right? Just like I said, bonding differs, you know, determined by the role and function that we hold. We have to have a likability factor. If we're gonna be leaders and have personal power, we have to have likability. There's no doubt about it. And you know, you'll hear these excuses from some people. And the excuses, I think, are really a defense mechanism. That's my opinion, is when someone is really concerned that they lack the ability to be liked, then they may attempt to invalidate the concept. And what, what are the kind of excuses that I have heard? If you give an inch, they'll take a mile. Why go out of your way to be likable? They don't even appreciate it. When I'm nice, half the staff just say I'm showing favorites. How many times have I heard that one? 
I guess the resolution for that person is I'm not going to be nice to anyone. And so it solves that one, right? If you have, you have to take a hard line approach. If you don't, they'll gain the upper hand, right? When I try to be nice, some of the staff accuse me of being manipulative. Colleagues, no excuses. We need to be likable, need to be likable. Our lives are impacted more by the choices people make about us than by the choices we make about them. You ever thought about that? None of us would be employed. I wouldn't be doing this right now. You wouldn't be employed where you are employed unless somebody made a choice for you to be there. And they weren't saying to themselves as boy, uh, I don't like you. So that's why I'm gonna offer you employment. In addition to whatever skills we have, we had to be likable. Right. Admission to college. Two students have equal credentials. They go for an interview to the college. One gets accepted. The other one may not because of an issue of likability. Consideration for promotion. Gee, when all is said and done, people may have very similar capabilities and competencies, but the person who is likable is more likely to be promoted. The reason I asked my wife to marry me is I didn't like her. Of course not. You know, likability determines whether somebody's going to be asked to be married and whether the other person's going to accept. Beneficiary of an insurance policy, right? Designation for inheritance. You know, you ever hear these families say, very, very wealthy families, they'll say something like, uh, I really love my son, but I'm not going to leave him anything because we don't like him. No, I'm not making that up. He's not likable. They don't want to leave him anything. Will you be chosen? Now, because we're basically out of time, let's take a quick look. And I'm just going to go through this with you in terms of some of the skills and each of these deserving of a lot of discussion. Smile. Smiling is the way the face gives an emotional hug. Smiling says, hi, I care about you. Come into my Come into my space, right? Next tool, eye contact. When you're talking to people, interacting with them, look into their eyes. Yes, I understand that eye contact has a cultural influence, right? I mean, there are some cultures, uh, Asian cultures, Native American cultures, African cultures, where you show your humility, you show your respect by looking down. I don't live there, I live here, and you come to talk to me and I won't look at you. You're not thinking, hey, Tom really values me. No, that's. That would not be the case, right? Sense of humor, another tool. How do you feel about people who have a sense of humor? Are you repulsed by them or attracted to them? What does she say about him? I guess he could say it about her, but more commonly it's she says about him. I just met this guy. He has a wonderful sense of humor. She wasn't saying that because she was suggesting she just met Groucho Marx. I mean, she was saying that because that sense of humor indicates that one is comfortable with who they are joke and risk allowing themselves to be vulnerable knowing that other people may not laugh right and uh be a good listener that's a wonderful personal power tool how do you feel about people who truly listen to you i used to think listening was thinking about what it was i was going to say while the other person was talking i had no idea i could give you a long explanation about why i didn't understand what listening was but now when, and I try my very best, I'm not saying I'm successful as much as I would like to be, but when people are talking to me and when they think they're done, and a lot of the discussions tend to be pretty passionate, what I'll do is when I think they're done, I'll go to myself 1001, 1002, 1003, 1004, 1005, and then start talking. Because I don't want to cut them off. I want them to know I'm listening. Hey, Linda, are we at that point? Abby, did I lose everybody? I was supposed to stop at 2.55. Linda, you're Hello. muted. Pardon me? Linda's, Linda's muted. Linda's muted? Well, is it yeah. time for time for questions? I was told to stop at this point. Oh, Linda, okay, that's okay. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> is there a, is the disconnect on my end or do I have it correct? It was working fine, but anyways, um, it is time. So we will go through 
the questions. Let's see what we've got here. Okay. So first question. Oh, this is a good one. Um, we have all these challenges and changes that you've shared that are going to occur. Leadership is critical. What do you think the system will look like in 10 to 15 years? Boy, that's that's a great, great question. And then I'm gonna give you my opinion. Obviously, I'm I'm not a fortune teller. Uh, in 10 to 15 years, the system will look nothing like it looks today. It will be a voucher-based system. And I, 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 I'm willing to put my professional reputation on the line on that. There is no way I can perceive how we can achieve the requirements of the final rule. And that final rule is not, some people refer to it as the new settings rule. And we're not gonna be, no one's gonna back off on that. I mean, the screws are gonna start to be tightened here real soon. Most states don't even truly understand what in the hell that thing is, okay? But as this comes down, we know it was supposed to have gone into effect, right? March 17 of this year, 2023. And um, there are um, only five states in the, in the country that have claimed that they have made, completed successfully their transition plan, only five. All the other states have a cap, a corrective action plan to meet it. And the five states that claim they have made the transition plan, none of those to the best of my knowledge have been re uh, reviewed and approved by the Centers on Medicaid and Medicare. So that, that requirement for home and community-based wavered services is so, it's not thinking outside of the box, it blows up the box. The only way I know that we can meet it is with a voucher-based system where individuals are assessed and evaluated and then dollars are allocated, waiver dollars, and the person can take their voucher and go off and do good things. Decide who and how and where they're going to live, what their day is going to look like. And probably without rare exception, most states are already have something like that in place. It's called, in many states, self-determination projects where people receive so many dollars and they can go off and pay their mother or brother to provide residential supports or whatever. That's what I anticipate it's gonna be. I, I don't, historically, we have done a much better job of finding people for places than places for people. Let me say it again. Historically, we've done a much better job of finding people for places than places for people. But with the new settings rule, that's all gone. So this current system of, hey, state, we have an empty bed, people remember this bed. You got somebody to put in there? That's all gone. I mean, that, that will not exist. There will be no placement because there will be no place. So the only way I know to make that work is through a voucher-based system. So thanks for the question. Of course. Um, let's see, we've got another one. This was a really informative session, packed with a lot to think about. What's the biggest takeaway you want us to share with our teams? The biggest takeaway, when you say team, all members of the team, uh, it is relationships before issues and tasks. <coughs> That's it. There's, there's no doubt about it. And uh, relationships before issues and tasks. And the agencies that I think that just do the very, very best really understand that um and i won't hesitate i'll give you the name of two agencies and i'm willing to, to say i mean it doesn't mean that there's not thousands of agencies but an agency does that really really well in new york is heritage christian services in rochester new york they, they're very relationship based one in california tierra del sol in sunland california very relationship based so the agencies that are really moving sort of cutting edge, evidence-based practice, that's what they do. And that would that that would be the one takeaway I would like for everyone to, to take away. It's the relationship that comes first. Great. Um, we do, I know we're out of time. We are gonna keep going with a couple more questions, but if you are not able to, um, to stay on for the rest of the questions and you have another question, um, you can, I dropped our email in the chat um, you can email us. You'll also be getting an email tomorrow um, from us with the recording and information to contact Dr. Pomeranz because he has um, graciously offered to provide any 
to speak with you on the phone or via email um, for one year after this session if you attended it. Yeah, so. and I want to I want to further reinforce that is that I am delighted. I just don't want to drop this stuff on you folks, and um, I'm very committed to that. So anyone who wants to, you know, I'll be happy by text, email, virtual, phone call, whatever works best. Um, to engage in conversation, to share, answer any questions and thoughts about how you can make some of this, make some of these things work, especially some of the you that may be struggling with the final rule issues. Um, and again, I, I have an advantage because there's a lot of really smart people out there and part of my job is to steal everything I can get my hands on and then take the things that seem to really be working well over here and how can we share it over, you know, with other people. So I'll be happy to help in any way. Awesome. Well, we have one more in here that I'm going to ask you. So, and if anyone else has any other questions, we have some more time if you want to drop in a question. Um, but for now, what are your thoughts on pushing back against multi-state nonprofits or for-profits acquiring local organizations? Losing local control and local knowledge does not seem to be in the best interest of our system as a whole. I don't know if I totally understand the the question. Um, I, I'm not I sure to answer. I'm, I'm not sure how to answer it. Is in other words, if somebody sometimes people ask me the question, they'll say smaller is better. Now, mm -hmm. if that is the question, I have an answer for that one. Is smaller is better? Um, we haven't really found smaller is better in the healthcare system. I would much rather go to Indiana University healthcare system than a rural hospital. You know, if I have very serious stuff, I want to go someplace where they have a wide amount of expertise and ability. So, and it's not not to to undermine what small can do, but I have not seen any evidence, honestly of organizations by virtue of just being small is going to make them better. Are there small organizations that do a wonderful job? Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. But I, I don't, I have not seen evidence by virtue of being large that that is going to impair quality in and of itself. What impairs quality is the lack of leadership, not size, mm -hmm. in my opinion. I think you've answered that question well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again for being here. And thank you to Anchor for doing this with us. This was such a great session and we really appreciate it. Okay. Thank you all. Have a great day. Bye. Yeah, you thank too. you, everybody. Thanks, Metasked.